Okay, well, thank you, um, Bassam, so much for this wonderful invitation. It's such a pleasure to speak um, to your group. And, um, you know, when this talk was first given, it was for the ISHRS meeting, which was held in Lisbon. And I was unfortunately not able to go. I really wanted to be there, um, but it, it was for seven minutes. So it's nice to be able to have a little bit more time to, you know, go more, more slowly through the the data and you know, kind of discuss it um, in more detail. Um, so for those of us who treat hair loss for a living, you know, COVID has certainly rocked our world. Um, you know, not only has it made it harder for us to see patients in person, um, but I've found especially it's changed the way I practice. I'm doing a whole lot more virtual visits with my patients. Um, and I think that's a good thing because, you know, it, it's certainly made things easier for patients, um, but it's not always possible to do the entire visit uh, virtually. So, um, you know, there's still many patients who we do have to see in person, um, but we're going to go ahead and uh, move forward with some of these slides. Um, I'll try to, let me see. Um, so I, I don't have any relevant disclosures. I would like to acknowledge uh, dermatologist, uh, Dr. Carlos Bombier. He is at Brown University and he um, had helped me kind of put some of these slides together and um, to put together some of the um, content for this lecture. So, um, so I'm imagining everyone in this group has great familiarity with telogen effluvium. I, I show these pictures of bags of hair and everybody usually laughs because it's so common. You know, our patients can bring in these baggies. Sometimes they'll bring in a poster board full of globs of hair taped on, um, you know, and, and we see a lot of telogen effluvium, um, which occurs usually three to six months after any sort of major physiologic stressor. And you know, we usually are able to confidently counsel our patients, it's gonna go away, but you, know, you do probably have to give it another three to six months. Um, you know, give it a, a tincture of time, if you will. You probably don't necessarily need to do any intervention if, it, if there's some obvious reason why they're having the hair loss um, you know, so suddenly. Um, childbirth is usually the most common cause of telogen effluvium, but it can occur with, you know, things like severe caloric deprivation, as in some of these, you know, uh, crash diets, um, high fever, you know, any kind of prolonged illness or hospitalization, um, general anesthesia. Um, I don't know about the United Kingdom, but in America, it's become very trendy for women to get these testosterone pellets where they're getting them injected in their buttocks every few months. And they're showing up in droves in our clinics because their hair is coming out like crazy. Um, but then, you know, other hormonal changes like starting or stopping birth control, the, those can certainly contribute to telogen effluvium. Um, I looked in the medical literature between the link between COVID and telogen effluvium. And, um, you know, when I was preparing this talk for Lisbon, there were um, there was something like I think 24 publications um, connecting uh, in PubMed connecting COVID with telogen effluvium, and now we're up to something like 35 publications. I was just checking it this morning. Um, so you know there, there's really lots of reports um, you know linking uh, the the diffuse onset of hair shedding with COVID. Um, this publication, this is a research letter back in July of 2021, where they did a retrospective analysis, um, you know, for, for America, at least, you know, New York City was really the epicenter of COVID cases. And um, what they found was that pre-pandemic, there was only about 39 patients that were um, reported to have TE versus post-pandemic, you know, it was almost triple that number. And so, um, you know, that, that really, you know, pointed to more and more people uh, developing telogen effluvium as a result of COVID. Um, what was interesting from this data was that it, it seemed to affect the, the darker skin patient population more so than the whiter Caucasian. 
Um, and I'm not sure we really have an explanation for this, but we will circle back a little bit later uh, when we touch on certain genetic factors. All right. So, and here's just some data from that publication. You can see here um, the increase in the incidence of uh, telogen effluvium cases before and after the pandemic in the um, white um, Caucasian population. And then look at, you know, this jump um, in the Hispanic um, and then the other um, patient population groups. So <clears throat> we talked about how before there was 25, now there's like 35. Um, I love this letter. This was a, a, a case report um, where they looked back at 30 different cases. There were 29 women, nine men. Um, and what they were interested in was the timing. And what they found was that the timing of uh, post-COVID telogen effluvium is actually shorter than we're used to seeing with traditional telogen effluvium. So, you know, they found it was as early as 45 days. That's, that's really only about six weeks, if you think about it. Um, and then the timeline of the shedding was another 47 days. So, you know, I guess it's something we can reassure our patients about, like, you know, your, your shedding will come on more quickly and hopefully it will resolve more quickly as well, um, at least based on the data that's currently available to us. Um, this was a study um, out of Spain where they looked at patients, they enrolled 214 patients who had the acute telogen effluvium between uh, that early, you know, March 2020 of the pandemic throughout the summer of August. And, um, you know, 89% of them had a confirmed uh, prior COVID infection. And um, looking specifically at their um, you know, their underlying presentation of illness, 86% of them did have fever, um, whereas only 13% of them had an asymptomatic infection. So I think it's probably not unlike other things we see with telogen effluvium, the sicker you are, maybe the higher your fever, the more prolonged your illness, probably the higher the odds are that you're gonna have a more severe presentation of telogen effluvium. Um, um, I love this. This was a little case report. It talked about how um, a woman had presented basically not even knowing that she had COVID, um, but she did develop fever. She had crackles in her lung base. She had not been tested for COVID at that time. And then she actually recovered, you know, over a couple of weeks. And then her presentation of massive hair shedding two months later was what made the clinician say, hmm, let's go back and check her. And she had not only the massive hair shedding, but she also had this characteristic peeling of fingers and then um, the characteristic, what we call bow lines in dermatology, where she had these horizontal lines on her fingernails, you know, where she had had abrupt cessation of, um, you know, the, the, carrot, the uh, nail growth process that corresponded with a probably abrupt cessation of the hair growth. And then she did at that point test positive for COVID antibodies. Um, interesting, looking at data out of um, Italy, um, you know, there's some studies looking at the psychological implications. And they actually looked, they, they said, okay, there's 20, 25 Caucasian female patients who had been studied, they had TE prior to this national quarantine and they followed up with them via webcam and they had them all perform this modified WASH test. Um, and all of the patients did have much higher stress levels than they did before the pandemic. Um, but even 14 of the 25 who had negative modified WASH tests were perceived to have higher stress levels and more shedding, um, which, you know, kind of makes us realize, okay, are you stressed because you had COVID or are you stressed because you're stressed about COVID? <laughs> and so, you know, it kind of makes you think, well, maybe we're, you know, some of our patients are working themselves up into such a frenzy that they're losing hair just from the stress of thinking about COVID. You know, I, I don't think that's impossible, you know, at least based on my own patients, my own family, my own friends and experiences, you know, this is a very scary time, you know, trying to live through this pandemic. But they actually suggested this term, trichopsychodermatology, uh, specifically to help, you know, manage psychosocial aspects of, of hair disorders. 
So maybe something to consider. Um, how is COVID affecting alopecia areata? Um, there have been some interesting reports looking at how short-term uh, stress-related, you know, can possibly, you know, cause some increasing cases of alopecia areata. Um, and, you know, there was some work done basically interviewing people through these web-based questionnaires. Um, you know, our, our, our colleague, Dr. Troub, and um, I think he's in Switzerland, right? Um, you know, he also kind of delved into, you know, what can the hair tell us about COVID-19? Um, there was this interesting case report of a, a patient who had alopecia areata prior to COVID, and she had completely regrown her hair on tofacitinib, which is you know, one of the JAK inhibitors. She was taking five milligrams twice a day. She had gotten her hair completely back. And then when she got COVID um, approximately two weeks after, she, 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 she ended up losing almost all of her hair. And so they stopped the tofacitinib during that time because um, they, you know, they were concerned, you know, maybe it, whatever immune suppressive effects of the tofacitinib that might worsen her COVID or it might prolong her response to the COVID. So she was off of drug for about two to three weeks, but then she got back on it. And what they reported in the study was that she did not regrow her hair um, even after getting back on the medicine. Now, another group of researchers had a different experience. Um, Dr. Lydia Rudnicka, she's in Poland. Um, she, she, they, uh, she and colleagues looked back at their patients. She had about 32 patients with mild to moderate alopecia areata. And basically they followed their SALT scores, which you know, is their degree of severity of, of hair loss, um, you know, one to six weeks. Uh, before getting the COVID-19, and then they followed up um, about three months after the disease onset to compare, um, you know, what, um, what, how the, how, how their alopecia areata had been affected by having COVID. Um, and some of these patients, you know, they were getting steroid injections, they were getting oral steroids, um, you know, some of them were on uh, more immunosuppressive treatments like cyclosporin, methotrexate, azathioprine. Um, and, and so they did have to actually get off of the medical therapies um, as a result. But what they found was that um, most of the patients, their alopecia areata did not seem to get any worse. Um, there were about 10 of the 32 patients who had sort of a diffuse hair loss, more consistent with telogen effluvium. Um, I can see how that could have been superimposed on the alopecia areata, <clears throat> but none of their patients seem to have specific worsening of the alopecia areata. So, so there's sort of different reports out there in the medical literature. Um, but, you know, at the heart of all this is, you know, possible gender differences. And that, that was really what got me interested in looking at the COVID hair loss medical literature. Um, you know, if you look at epidemiologic data going back to March of 2020 in Wuhan, China, when they looked at 487 cases, the men, male gender, showed an odds ratio of 3.68. So it was much higher. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm somehow forwarding this before I mean to. Sorry about that, guys. Um, another study uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine just a month later, they looked at 1,099 cases in China, and they found that the rate of severe uh, cases of COVID-19 in men was actually 58% versus just 42% in women. And um, the JAMA, our publication, um, looked in May of 2020, they looked at 5,700 cases admitted to 12 hospitals in New York. And, um, they found six times more male admissions in the 40 to 49 year age group versus um, two times more male admissions in the 30 to 49 age group. So, um, you know, there, there seems to be something there. And that was, that, that's what Carlos Bombier and his colleagues have, have been sort of after and investigating. Um, you know, so why is this? You know, what what's happening? Do women maybe have stronger immune systems? Um, <laughs> are men taking more risks? Are they, 
you know, out there doing more socializing? Um, are they less able to social distance somehow? Um, or could there be some kind of a link between COVID-19 infection and androgen sensitivity? Um, and so, you know, I think that that does seem to, to be a possibility related to how the virus it can actually invade the body. Um, so if we look in the medical literature, you know, the, the first thing we know about this COVID viral spike protein is that it has to undergo this proteolytic priming um, by this transmembrane protease serine 2. Um, and it has this 15 base pair androgen response element. And we know that in humans, androgens are the only known transcription promoters for the TMPRSS2 gene. So, so that's one thing. And then the second is that when the COVID virus enters these type two pneumocytes in the human lung by anchoring to that ACE2 cell surface receptor, oops, um, this ACE2 receptor may have higher activity in males. So, you know, by looking at this diagram from the Cleveland Clinic, you can kind of see that. So, so um, Dr. Uh, Vambier and his colleagues, they actually published this preliminary observation uh, saying, you know, we're looking at what's happening in these COVID-19 patients in Spain. It seems like male pattern hair loss, you know, um, seems to play a role here. Um, they specifically looked at two Spanish hospitals between March 23rd and April 6th of 2020, and they found um, they, they specifically looked at 41 Caucasian patient, male patients with bilateral COVID pneumonia. So they were pretty ill. Um, they had an average age of 58. And among them, what they found was that 71% of them had clinically significant andro androgenetic alopecia. Um, you know, 29% just had more of a mild picture, but 39% did in fact have severe androgenetic alopecia. Now, one limitation was there weren't any age match controls for the incidence of AGA in the Spanish population, um, but they compared it with prevalence data of 31 to 53%, which is much lower um, in a comparable Caucasian population. Then they went on and they did another larger observational study and they looked at 175 patients who were hospitalized with COVID-19 and they looked at the frequency of androgenetic alopecia and they found, wow, 79% of the men who were hospitalized had hair loss and uh, up to 42% of the women who were hospitalized also had hair loss. So they proposed the Gabrin sign. This gentleman, uh, Dr. Frank Gabrin was an emergency room physician uh, working in New York and um, he was, um, you know, otherwise he was very healthy. I think he had a history of testicular cancer. That was his only main morbidity, but he did have hair loss. And so they suggested, you know, call, creating the Gabrin sign in his honor after he was the first U.S. physician to die from COVID. Um, and he happened to also have hair loss. But it raised some interesting questions. Number one, can anti-androgen therapies possibly help treat COVID? Um, if you look at the mechanism, you know, behind some of these different anti-androgen therapies, you know, it does seem like there may be possibility here where they could interfere with that TMPR SSA gene, um, <clears throat> possibly blocking, you know, activation of those androgen receptors and ultimately cell infection. Um, so one of the studies was, um, came out of the um, oncology slash urology literature where they were looking at androgen deprivation therapy for prostate cancer. And this was um, a study basically looking at patients who um, had been on medicines um, and, and basically suggesting that use of these anti-androgen therapies could protect against severe COVID-19 infection. Um, so this was 77 patients who were enrolled between March and May of 2020. In cohort one, uh, the patients taking anti-androgens for at least six months prior to hospitalization included 12 men either on dutastride, finasteride, or spironolactone. And they compared it with a second cohort of patients not on any anti-androgens. And what they found was that the proportion of patients admitted to the ICU was significantly lower in the anti-androgen group. 
Um, so 8% rate of admission versus 58% rate of admission in patients who were not on antiandrogen therapy, which is very interesting. Um, here's another um, study basically looking at whether these 5-alpha reductase inhibitors um, could help uh, reduce the frequency of COVID-19 symptoms. Um, this was a retrospective analysis looking at 300 men who had COVID-19. Um, and again, we had 65 patients not taking 5-alpha reductase inhibitors versus 48 patients taking dutasteride, 0.5 milligrams daily. And they found a statistically significant reduction in the frequency of 20 out of 29 clinical symptoms. Um, most notably, anosmia, agusia, headache, and dry cough. So, so this ended up prompting the initiation of another larger study um, looking specifically at dutasteride as well as a novel antiandrogen proxalutamide. So, we'll, um, so, so this proxalutamide, they have already done studies, and it's amazing how, how, much, how rapidly they've been investigating these things. Um, but what they found was that it, in 236 COVID positive patients who were not requiring hospitalization, um, either they were given proxalutamide 200 milligrams per day for one week or placebo. And at, on day seven, vir that viral level was undetectable in 82% of the treatment group versus 31% of placebo. Um, they also found that proxalutamide could help reduce the rate of hospitalization. Uh, same sort of intervention, uh, 268 male patients who got the drug or got the placebo. <clears throat> and what they found was that 30 day rate, 30 day hospitalization rate was only 2.2% in the treatment group versus 26% in the placebo group. So very interesting. Um, the other thing it raises a question of is, is there a genetic link here to explain disease severity? Um, so we know that on the chromosome, the X chromosome, you know, we have these polymorphic CAG repeats. And some people have shorter CAG repeats. Some people have longer CAG repeats. But the patients who have the shorter CAG repeats can have higher androgen receptor expression. And, you know, the theory is that those same people who have, you know, manifestations of higher androgen receptor expression, such as hair loss, oily skin, acne, that may be the same group of people who are also subject to possibly worse COVID severity or mortality. Um, the other thing is... Um, and this is sort of just a small little part. I haven't, I haven't had a chance to dig deeper into this, but they found that patients of African descent often have more short CAG repeats, um, which is one of the reasons they, they think could explain why the African-American patient population was hit so much harder by COVID um, in, the early, or in the early days. Um, now, follow up to this, you know, there was a, a publication in the journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, probably Dr. Vambier's arch enemy, but, you know, wanting to refute all of his claims. Um, but what they did was <clears throat> they used this genome-wide association data to see if there was really a possible genetic correlation between the different phenotypes of male pattern hair loss in COVID-19. And they went back, they enrolled all these patients in this uh, UK biobank, um, and they found no evidence for a global genetic correlation, but there were two major limitations of the study. Number one, uh, the baldness pattern was largely self-reported. So, you know, they didn't have an independent clinician there ranking each person. And they also did not look at X-linked genetic factors. So, you know, the X-linked genetic factors, that's actually where all the action is because of that, that's where that androgen receptor gene is located. Um, so I, I think, you know, it's hard to really put too much stock in this particular publication since they left off that very important component. So in summary, you know, it does, there, there seems to be irrefutable evidence that, you know, COVID can be linked with, you know, new onset telogen effluvium. 
Um, there's just so many widespread reports in the medical literature. Um, but I do think there is also evidence to say that this androgen sensitivity can play a role in the increased rate of morbidity and mortality among patients who are infected. Um, I'm excited and interested to watch how you know these clinical trials may help us identify new or existing therapies. Um, who knows, we may all be taking proxalidomide every morning uh, to help us keep the COVID away, um, just like taking an, eating an apple to keep the doctor away. Um, but, you know, it's also interesting looking at these genetic links, seeing how they may play a role. Um, I think for us practitioners who are specifically working every day with pa patients who have hair loss, you know, let's, let's, let's play the best role we can. Let's encourage vaccination. Um, you know, realizing that they are possibly at a higher risk of, of, you know, dying from the disease. I personally have had two patients who died of COVID, um, you know, <clears throat> and then also if they're on some kind of a hair loss medication and anti-androgen therapy, you know, really encouraging them to continue with them, not only um, for their hair, but who knows, it may have some benefits uh, in terms of keeping them healthy and, and out of the hospital as well. Thank you.